was two weeks ago, and we were just walking through some Bible scriptures, and um, they were, they're quite hard-hitting. I know that you know your Bibles. Um, and uh, we were looking at uh, the reality of the fact that, that, that we are born cut off from God. Um, we were looking at the reality from Ephesians 2, 3, which says this, all of us, because you know, all of the things that are in the Bible are, are talking to Christians, and all of the, the blessings are for Christians, and, and all of the, the wonderful things that God has in store for us in eternal life are for those who believe. And uh, what, what, um, what God desires is that all those who don't believe through their repentance come to him in their humility and they believe in the provision he has made for the defeat of evil and for the defeat of sin and the forgiveness of sin, which is what we've been um, celebrating over e Easter. Um, but Ephesians 2, 3 is a, is a sharp message to us who are on the other side because it's looking back to what we once were before we knew Jesus. So Ephesians 2, 3 says this, all of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our sinful nature and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, like the rest of humanity, like the rest, we were by nature objects of wrath. Serious, isn't it? Sin is serious. And um, we were exploring that, and I'm going to try and just wrap up um, this evening uh, just by looking at, in a bit more detail, looking at six things about God's wrath that we need to know about. Um, you know, we, we know that God is love, and Jesus uh, loves sinners. Jesus died for sinners. Jesus is, is God's means for sinners to be forgiven and to be put back into a right relationship with God. And so we have the tension of once we lived under God's wrath, we were objects of wrath, and yet the Savior is beckoning us to believe because he wants to forgive us. So God's love is shown in Christ Jesus and his death on the cross. And when we believe, we cease to be objects of wrath, we become children of God, we become friends of God, we're in the family. And that is how the Bible works. It's full of those contrasts. And um, when we think about uh, God's wrath, there are six things I wanted to just point out about God's wrath that we need to know about. And the first one is the anger, the righteous anger of God is not like our human anger. Now, I suspect that many of us are feeling angry at what is going on in the Ukraine. Helena and I, we met with some Ukrainian pastors. They were pastors of the Ukrainian church. And um, he was telling us a little bit about his life. And he's, he's just about coming up to 40. But in his life, he has experienced in the Ukraine three wars and two famines. And, 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 and you know, we today... Uh, are looking at the Ukraine and, uh, and there's a righteous anger coming up, isn't there? There's, there's, we don't like it. But when I think of my life compared to his life, he's seen three wars and he's been involved in two famines. You could not buy the food that you wanted when you wanted. You had to be incredibly frugal. And our lives are so privileged. And, and because of our uh, our privilege, often the danger of the Western world, is to bring God down to our human understanding and to become very friendly with God. Uh, but God sits high and lifted up on his throne, and he sees the whole big picture. His ways are not our ways. Uh, his thinking is not our thinking. And so even, even, I mean, I don't have children, but even as, as a father who loves his children, whatever they do, I'm not sure. I know that Jesus loves people, but God has said that we have a choice. We live under wrath or we live under his forgiveness and his grace. And these are very tough topics. God can do two things at the same time. He can be wrathful against sin and sin nature and against evil. And at the same time in Christ, he can love the whole world. And he beckons the whole world to come and to believe in the Savior. But there are six things about God's wrath. The anger of God is not like our anger. Does anyone here like getting angry a little bit? 
Does anyone occasionally, particularly if you know you're right, do you like the, the feeling of, of the anger that rises up and you know you're right and you, you feel satisfied when you're a bit angry? Yes and no? Does anyone need an example? Some of you are being honest and saying yes. And, and, and you know, if I was a good teacher, I would have a really good example. Um, but uh, maybe we'll come back to that. Think of an example when you know you've been right and you felt quite satisfied of being angry. Because there is an emotion, isn't there? As a human being, we are emotional creatures and we can actually fall into sin by letting our emotions run away with us. So our anger often, even though we think we're right and proper, our anger rises up, but actually there's a part of our anger which probably is sinful. We're not always holy and righteous, are we? Even if we try to be, there'll be aspects of things that we've not understood correctly, and we feel we've got that right. I mean, sometimes I often say to Helena, I'm really sorry I got that wrong. It's good to say when we're wrong, as well as good to say when we're right. So when we think about the anger of God, God's righteous anger, his wrath, is not like our anger. We have to remember that it's God that we're talking about. And we have to put God in the context of the whole Bible. So we have to put things in to God's righteous anger, such as God is always right. He's always just. God is always love, even though he can be righteously angry. God is good all the time. God is good. His nature is goodness. And so all of these characteristics of God need to be taken into account when we try to understand God's wrath, his righteous anger. So God will always be right in his anger. He will always judge the situation correct. He knows all things. So God will get it right every single time, correct? Even in our righteous anger, we probably get it wrong most of the time. But God gets it right 100% of the time. And when we think about righteous anger and we think about the word wrath, it makes us think about our human experience. And I know that all of us have suffered because we have been hurt. Uh, we've all come across angry people. We've all come across people who lose their temper with us. We all um, uh, come across people who maybe uh, treat us um, uh, in the wrong way, and we get hurt. Our anger, when we are angry, we can become unpredictable. Um, in fact, the Bible says you've got to be very careful. Do not go to sleep angry. Actually deal with your anger quickly because our anger can bubble over into terrible sin and destruction. We can be very petty in our anger. God is not petty. He doesn't, he's not angry because he feels like being angry. He is always righteously angry and he's always angry against a, a particular object. It's the way the Bible describes it, it's evil. That will include Satan or demonic forces and it's sin, and that is what we, are, what we do and what we do to each other. And so God is always righteously angry with a, with a good and proper biblical reason. And um, although, um, uh, although we get emotional, our anger boils over, uh, 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 we, we sometimes misdirect it, God never, ever does that. In fact, we're told that, that God is full of patience. He is slow to anger. He, he is quick to bless. The heart of God, in one sense, is not to be angry. He's slow to anger. However, he has to be righteously angry because the evil in the world and the evil one demand it. So God's wrath is always just. It's always measured. It's always coming out of his holiness and his righteousness, which is why we say the wrath of God is righteous anger. So God is not like us, and somehow we have to elevate our understanding of the wrath of God uh, by taking 
our human experience, but recognizing when, when we go wrong and not projecting that onto God. It can be very easy to project ourselves upwards and say God is like us. He isn't. So the anger or the wrath of God is not like our anger. It comes out of his love and his holiness. The second thing to say is that God's wrath is provoked. Has anyone here been provoked to anger? We all have with what's going on in Ukraine. Something has happened on the planet in the Ukraine and we are provoked to our own human anger. And actually that's similar with God because the, the uh, wrath of God is provoked. The anger of God is not something that is in God by his nature. Okay, that's an important point. God by nature is love, he's life, he's light, he's all of those things that we know. So God's wrath, his anger is not something that is in him by nature that is just waiting to burst out. Um, I don't know if you know uh, many angry people. Um, I don't know uh, when on the TV screens you, you see debates between politicians and you can see the anger in their faces. I don't know whether you're an angry person, but I guess all of us at one point in time, we have been angry. And our anger actually, sadly, is part of our sinful nature. Okay, we are not like God. And so anger is something which, whew, you know, we have to put this to death. We are to put to death these attributes which are in us by nature. We have been saved spiritually. We are, we're a new nature and we have power over sin through Christ Jesus. But we have to work at it. God doesn't have to work at anything. Okay, God's wrath is righteously provoked. So the Bible obviously says that God's nature is love and God's love is not provoked. And God does not love because he sees some beauty in us. Um, God's love is not provoked. His nature is love. So uh, because his nature is love, he, he just is love. But because his nature is not anger or wrath, what the wrath comes out because something provokes it, something pricks into it. Does that make sense? So this is, this is one of the things, okay. Um, so so God, God doesn't love um, because he, he thinks I'm handsome or he thinks I'm wise or intelligent or I've got wonderful attributes. God loves me because I, I'm in Christ. And God loves his son, and so God loves me because I'm in Christ. And, um, uh, and, and because um, I'm in Christ, uh, my sins are covered. So actually, uh, I don't provoke God's wrath. I don't provoke his righteous anger against me. Um, all of that fell on Christ, okay? However, without Christ, then sin, and the sin that's going on in the world, uh, and what people do to one another does provoke his anger. And so that's why Ephesians chapter 3 says that without Christ, we are living under the provoked anger of God because we're provoking the anger because of our, our sin and our, the sin nature in the world. So God's wrath is different. Uh, God's wrath is his holy response. It's God's holy response to the intrusion of evil into the world. So, God is permanently angry at Satan. I can tell you that, permanently, permanently angry at evil. And we know the story, and the prophecy starts in, in Genesis. You know, he's gonna strike Jesus' heel, but Jesus is gonna stamp on his head, hallelujah, and have the victory, and we celebrated that recently. Um, and so if there, if there was no sin in the world or no evil, then there would be no wrath in God. There is nothing to provoke his holy response to what has gone terribly wrong. Does that make sense? So by nature, God is love. Um, um, and what is happening that is evil, sinful, or terrible 
is prodding God's wrath coming out of his holiness. I think that makes sense. So God's wrath is provoked. So the Bible, uh, the Bible teachings about the wrath of God um, is very different from, you know, ancient mythologies um, that say that gods are, are angry and they're looking to hit you with a stick. God isn't looking to hit us with a stick. Um, he hit Christ with the stick. Uh, Moses hit the rock with the stick and the living water came out. So God is, um, God is different to any, anything that we can think of and it can be quite hard to explain, but I've done enough on that one. So, so first, uh, the anger of God is not like our anger. He is not like us. And God's not in his nature wrathful, he is love, but his wrath is provoked and his holiness responds in righteous anger. The third thing, this is good to know, God is slow to anger. And, um, you know, the fall happened six, seven, ten thousand 10,000 years ago, however you look at it. Sin entered the world, the fall came. God had created everything and he said, it is good, it is good, it is good. He didn't say, I love it, I love it, I love it. He said, it, it was good, it was good, it was good. Love comes in Christ later. Um, uh, and then evil comes into the world. And evil has been in this world for how long? Millions of people have been murdered and killed and plundered and pillaged and you name it. It's horrendous what has happened on this planet. Um, and it's continuing. And when we go to the end of the Bible, uh, the Bible tells us it, it will get an awful lot worse. And so worse is coming. So actually this isn't bad. What's happening now in the scheme of things actually isn't bad, but it is bad. It is bad, isn't it? I mean, it provokes us to this anger, it's bad. But God is slow to anger and he allows this to continue. He allows it to continue. Why doesn't God just wipe the whole thing out? Why doesn't God just end it now? Why is God slow to anger? Well, it seems to me that the Bible says this, that grace and truth is found in Jesus Christ. Jesus put the thing right only 2,000 years ago. Jesus put it right only 2,000 years ago. And so we've had 2,000 years of time where the grace of God has been in the world alongside the evil of Satan and the sin and the evil and the wickedness of man. And the grace of God is there for one reason, so that you and I could be saved for a start. Amen? God's holding off in his righteous anger and his wrath. He's holding off, and one of the reasons was Jesus saw you and me, that we would fall in love with him, that he would come running to us, that he would forgive our sins and wash us in his blood, that he would pick up the mess that we are and that he would make us into his brother. He saw that and so he held off. So he wasn't gonna, he wasn't gonna come before I got saved. He wasn't gonna come before you got saved. But there will be a time when God's righteous anger is provoked so much that he says, enough is enough. I've, the history of the Bible has played out. Jews are back in their home. Third temple's been built. All of the prophecies that God has seen. There is an appointed terrible day of the Lord that we spoke about. That is coming. But at the moment, God is slow to anger. He had you and I and the Christians of tomorrow and the Christians of the next hundred years maybe in mind. And so he held off from obliterating everything and starting again. So God holds out to offer grace and forgiveness in his son, Jesus Christ. 2 Peter 3, 9 says this, people are coming to him in faith and repentance every day, and God patiently holds open the door of grace. The day of God's wrath will come, but God is not in a hurry to bring it, because then the door of grace will be closed. And so, in one sense, we want to be raptured. Take us now, Lord. Come, Lord Jesus, come now. But in another sense, 
we can have the same heart of God, which is to be patient and which is to be slow because we want the world to be saved. We want the world to be saved. So perhaps our prayer is, hold off, Lord, hold off, Lord. We want more to be saved. Uh, certainly, um, uh, Billy Graham's son, isn't he? He's an, an evangelist following in his father's footsteps. If you did see the thing in Ukraine, he's an evangelist and his message is, come now, come now. The door will shut one day. Uh, but God is slow to anger because the grace of Christ is in the world and there's an opportunity for people to be saved. Not to be objects of wrath or destruction, but to be loved by God in Christ Jesus and to have an eternal hope and an eternal home. Amen. So God's anger is not like our anger. God's wrath is provoked, and evil provokes it, and evil wicked people provoke it, and God is slow to anger. The fourth thing, the fourth thing about uh, God's wrath is this, is God's wrath is revealed now. So how does, God's, how does God reveal his wrath when sinners suppress the truth about him this is Romans, and exchange the truth for a lie and worship created things rather than the creator. Do you remember two weeks ago, we looked at that very difficult Romans passage, and do you remember I said that you know, people who are determined, God helps them along, hardens their heart, he gives them more of what they want. And so in a strange way, God's righteous anger, his wrath, is actually being revealed today. And it's being revealed in Romans 1.24, where it says this, Therefore God gave them up in the lusts of their hearts to impurity. For this reason, God gave them up to dishonorable passions. That's Romans 1.26. And Romans 1.28 says, God gave them up to a debased mind. Do you know, God, um, we're not computers, and God doesn't control us. If he did control us, and if we were computers, we would all be saved. Yeah. Correct, okay? We have this thing called free will, and uh, whilst God allows us to have free will, you know, if we are determined, and we're determined, and we're determined, then sometimes God gives a little more of a shove. Now, I know many, many people who have had the shove, and they've got so bad that they've cried out to God and they've become Christians and saved. Maybe that is one reason why God shows some of his, his righteous anger now upon people and makes their situation worse. Maybe it's in the hope that they will turn to Christ. You know, in the church, in, 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 in Matthew, I think it's five or something, you know, even in church, when there's uh, disputes in church or, or something's gone terribly wrong, there's immorality in the church, immorality in the church, then there's a process where the immorality person should be challenged by the church, should be talked to by the church. If they cease to change their ways, then the church should ask them to leave because it infiltrates the rest of the, the holy, holy people of God. And so in a sense, in a human sense, we are pushing people, or we're supposed to, in certain circumstances, and hand them over to Satan, the Apostle Paul says, Hand them over to Satan in the hope that they repent and turn back to Christ. Do you know that in the Bible? Are you aware of that, those scriptures? A lot of you are nodding your heads. If you're not aware of those scriptures, you need to read your Bible. Um, because sometimes God hands people over, I think, in the hope that actually they, they will come to the Savior. But we are not computers. We have free will. Uh, but it does say in Romans 1.28, you know, if you just read Romans chapters 1 to 3, you'll get a big force about, about all of this. God even gave them up to a debased way of thinking. And we don't half have a debased way of thinking in the Western world, don't we? In, in, in lots of different ways, the diversity agenda, the, 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 the sexual identity agenda is a very, very different thinking to God made them male and female to a husband and wife. It's completely different to God's mindset. And, uh, you know, I can see that maybe God, okay, he hands it over a bit more, hands it over a bit more. So in a way, God's wrath is being revealed even now, 
even though there's grace, there is a form of, of, of God's judgment. Uh, read Romans chapters 1 to 3. Uh, you'll get a bit of a handle on that. And the reason why uh, he does that is because they ha have an absolute refusal to see anything about the Savior, anything about the Creator. He is provoked. Um, and, uh, and you can read that, Romans chapters 1 to 3. Did you, did you know that God's righteous anger has been provoked on the earth even, even today? Or did you think that, that God was just sitting outside and just watching it all unfold? How active is God in the world? What is God doing? How active is he in the world? You know, he, ra he raises up. He raises up wicked. He did this in the Old Testament. He raises up wicked, wicked um, 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 powers to judge his people Israel. Is he the same God today or not? I'll leave you with some of those questions. I'm not here to answer everything, um, but um, it's good to think about some of these things. The, f the fifth thing about God's wrath is that God's wrath is stored up. Basic principle, God knows everything. God sees everything. God knows every thought and attitude of the heart. And throughout all of human history, all of human history, even though Christ died for the whole world, only those who turn to Christ have the benefits of his death, his life, his resurrection. God stores up. He remembers every single thing that has happened. How awful must that be? You know, I remember, I, I can only remember 10% of the awful things I've done in my life. Well, okay, maybe 60%. <laughs> it's horrible, isn't it? When we, when we look back and we go, oh, I wish I'd not done that, or I wish I hadn't said that, and, and we store these things up and, and we punish ourselves, we, we internalize it. God knows and remembers every single infringement of all humanity, of all evil and wickedness for all eternity. That's a lot of wickedness, isn't it? And God knows it all. And we did say that there's a terrible day of the Lord coming. And we have done some studies, haven't we, on the, on the, on the judgment of Christ over Christians and the final judgment of God is coming and, and Satan and all that is Satan's evil and wickedness gets thrown into the lake of fire. There's a terrible day of the Lord that is coming. And so the whole Bible story, if you like, is leading up to this one terrible day when God will deal with all evil fully, finally, and forever. Just, now, as a Christian, we should celebrate that, okay? And this will be the day of wrath, the, the, the holy day of God's righteous judgment called the day of wrath, the terrible day of the Lord. And God will recompense, God will bring everything into the open and God will bring everything under his judgment and he will judge it. So if you think about your, your life and he knows every single little detail, every thought, even the thoughts that you've had at night when you have, can't even remember your dreams. You know, he knows everything. Thank God we're in Christ. Thank God we're covered by the blood of Christ. We were once objects of wrath, but now we're not. We are not objects of wrath if we're in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. And God will do uh, this terrible day um, of the Lord. He'll do it in complete and total perfect justice. But remember, not like a human being would do it, with malice or with satisfaction of anger. He will do it out of holy righteousness. His ways, and he is different to us. And the punishment for every sin will match the crime I've got written here. You know in the Old, Old Testament, in the Old Covenant, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. God's judgment is perfect balance. Eye for eye, tooth for tooth. You poke my eye out, I have the right to poke your eye out. Okay, that's the way it works. And a lot of the Old Testament is God's judgment now because Christ hadn't come. There wasn't any grace. 
It was difficult to hold it all back. And so God will uh, uh, punish every sin and wickedness and evil uh, with the crime. And when the judgment is done, every mouth will be stopped because everyone will know that God judged in righteousness and justice. You know, we sing a song, every knee will bow. A time's coming where every single person is going to have to acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord. Unsaved as well as saved. This is a good reason to get the unsaved saved. And we are to be like God. We are to be, we are to be patient and kind and, and reaching out with the love of Jesus to bring people in so that they too, like us, are not objects of wrath. And then, once this final terrible day of the Lord has come, God will usher in a new heaven and a new earth, which will be his throne of righteousness. It will be completely finished. Hallelujah. No more wars. No more evil. No more distress or, or human anger, destruction. It will all cease. And we will be with well, brothers of Jesus, we will be in the family, having a banquet, the marriage of Lamb of the Feet, the marriage banquet of the, the Lamb. Of, oh, it's going to be great, isn't it? And so the anger of God is not like our anger. God's wrath is always, it's provoked. It's not really his nature. God is slow to anger because of grace. Come on in, get saved, turn to Jesus. God's wrath has been revealed now. If you're going to be that stubborn and that stubborn and that stubborn, He'll just shove you along a little bit, perhaps in a hope that you'll get so desperate you'll turn to, to God. And God's wrath is stored up. He knows everything that's happened. Every evil, every thought, every single thing that's gone on. And he remembers the whole thing. And in a way, that terrible day of the Lord is to, is to try to put human language to God. I was going to say is to try to, to cleanse everything that God, God, God has known about. It's like to remove it from him as well as to remove it from the whole system. You know, God, God says, you know, when we're in Christ, he remembers our sin no more. And I reckon, I do reckon on that, on that final day, on that final day of justice, the terrible day of the Lord, I reckon that, 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 that like us as an individual, he remembers our sins as far as he is from the West. All the stuff that he had to carry for all the centuries, of all the evil and the wickedness that, that every evil demon has done, every wicked person has done, I reckon the day comes when he chooses to remember it no more. Hallelujah. I, I, I don't know, I'm not sure if the Bible says that, but I mean, that's what I would do. You wouldn't want to remember it, would you? And I think that God will probably do that because the principle is he remembers our sins no more. And so when the new heaven and the new earth comes, it's just going forward for eternity. Amen. Oh. Don't really want to show you this one, but it is what the Bible says. Because this makes it a bit more personal. God's wrath is on sinners. Uh, it, this is a horrible, unpalatable, not nice statement. We don't like it. I would like to remove it from Scripture, but I can't. It's there too many times. I don't know what your reaction is to the statement um, of God's wrath is on sinners, and where does it come from? Well, it comes from the Bible. So let me show you this verse. John 3, 35 to 36. The Father loves the Son, hallelujah, and has placed everything in his hands, Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. But whoever rejects the Son will not see life, for God's wrath remains on him. Now, actually, I don't have to explain that, because that's self-explanatory. So if anyone's got any issues, a great, a great friend of mine said, you know, if anyone's got any issues with stuff like this, then don't argue with the messenger, argue with the author. <laughs> okay, argue with the author. But there are a number of scriptures that say this. And uh, you remember the story uh, I told you about my sister and me in the pub, where I was provoked out of my love for my sister. I said, Jenny, I don't want you to go to hell. 
And, um, you know, there was that, that, that human desire. I mean, we should be seeing every human being like that, really. We should be. We should have the love and the compassion for every single human being. And I'm sure Jesus is looking at, at, at Putin, desiring that Putin comes to him. Because Jesus loves Putin. The Bible tells me so. But Putin, it seems to me, if he doesn't believe in Jesus, God's wrath is remaining on him. That's what the Bible says. So John um, 3.36, um, well, it says this. He does not say, the wrath of God will come. Uh, oh, no. Uh, so John 36, okay, he doesn't say this. The wrath of God will come on the disobedient. It actually says, whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. It's very clear. And it's there because by nature, by nature, we have a problem. We cannot reach up to God. We cannot save ourselves. We are in a desperate need, which is why God sent his Son to die for us, so that when we believe, his wrath leaves us and his love is on us and in us. Does this not make sense? Yes. Okay. I won't labor it. I won't labor it. But that is a hard statement, and that is harsh. And, um, you know, there, there, there are theologians who would try to take these bits out of the Bible or try to explain them away in some other language, which isn't clear and plain as the Scriptures are. And um, whilst I might want to do that myself, I can't because it's pretty plain and clear to me. Um, but you might be different to me, but it's for you to work through. And so, um, uh, and so, and so God's uh, wrath, his righteous anger, which comes from his holiness, it's not like our anger. It's provoked. Uh, God is slow to anger. He wants people to come to Christ. His wrath is stored up because he knows and remembers absolutely everything. And he has to judge it. He can't avoid judging it because that's what holiness is. It has to judge and put things right. God's, God's wrath is happening now, helping people along in the wrong way, maybe with the hope that they come to Christ. And God's wrath is on sinners, people who refuse to accept Christ as Savior. So, to wrap up, oh no, I've got a few more. Oh no, I've gone way over half. I've, I've embellished this too much. So, God's wrath, in the next five minutes, God's wrath is righteous and judge and, and just. Psalm 7, 11 says this, God is a righteous judge, a God who expresses his wrath every day. What that means is he's, his holy, righteous judgments are being happening every day. Wrath comes from righteous judgment from a righteous judge. And it's a right judgment, guilty, not beyond reasonable doubt, because God knows everything is it's, it's guilty because you are guilty. Yeah, he knows everything. There's no loopholes with God. There's no gray. It's not, um, it's not a slap on the wrist. Oh, he went wrong. Never mind. It'll be all right in the end. God has to judge it. And that's why the Bible says there's a left way and there's a right way. The, the broad way leads to destruction. The narrow way, which is Christ, leads to life. How is God's wrath removed? We know this, so I can go quite quick. How is God's wrath removed from you and me, from the world? But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? What that is saying is, is uh, God has demonstrated his love in Christ. When I believe in Christ, I am then justified by the blood of Christ and therefore the wrath of God is removed. Amen. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 5.9. This is um, a passage often used to suggest that Christians will not be going through the tribulation because the tribulation is going to be full of wrath. But I'm not sure whether it does mean that. But what it does mean is, for God did not appoint the Christian, God did not appoint the believer in Christ to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation through Christ. 
These promises apply to the Christian. Amen? So, in conclusion, God is totally, totally, totally holy and righteous. Out of his holiness comes a righteous anger, which we call wrath, and that produces a righteous punishment. So, actually, God is very angry. Why? Because all of the sin of the world that is still there is provoking his anger. Why? Because Satan is doing all of his stuff still in the world. Whilst he's defeated, he's still active in the world, provoking God's anger. So, God is righteously angry. Does that make sense? Uh, God's wrath is against sin, against the original sin of mankind. And as hard as it seems in the scriptures we've read tonight, and believe me, there are more, it is a terrible thing to come into the hands of the living God without Jesus. And I, I can, I'll just leave it there. I think that's come through from the teaching. And um, actually, that's my testimony that you know. I came to a revelation that I was living under God's wrath. It hit me like a ton of bricks. And uh, the Holy Spirit just pointed me to Jesus. And I went running to receive Christ as Savior. And I don't know much about the Bible. I don't know much about, you know, the end times, you know, I don't know that much. But what I know is I did go forward to receive Christ as Lord and Savior. And I have to trust in that. And I have to stay in that as well. And if all I'm left with after a whole life of ministry, if it boils back to, I came to Christ and I gave my life to Christ, then you cover me, then that's got to be enough. Amen? Amen. So the reality is, is that all of us here who are Christians, we have lived at one time under God's wrath. We might not have known it, we might not have understood it, but it doesn't change the truth of the scripture. It is a profound and hard thing. Uh, God's wrath is only removed through the holiness of the gospel. The gospel, as we know, is a person, Jesus Christ, and God's wrath is only removed when we are in Christ Jesus. Amen. Actually, I have got a note here. Sometimes, you know, you know, there are doctrines and theologies that say everyone's going to heaven. All religions lead to the same place. It's not the Bible that I read. But for me, a belief like that, all it does is reduces Jesus to a person who God got, got spitefully angry with and just slashed out at instead of having Jesus raised high, dying for the sins of the world because we couldn't save ourselves. And so God's wrath is only removed when we're in Christ. There is no other way to salvation except through Jesus. Amen. If you can read that, this is the gospel in a nutshell. I can't see it. God created us to be with him. Our sins separated us from God. Sins cannot be removed by good deeds. Paying the price for sin, Jesus died and rose again. Everyone who trusts in him alone has eternal life. Life with Jesus starts now when you're a Christian and lasts forever. Gospel, the gospel in a nutshell. And um, I promised Jenny, I, there should be another slide in there, David. Is there not another slide? Oh, no. Put, put me on. There should be another slide. Oh, Jenny. I might get a slap of righteous anger from my sister in a moment. <laughs> What's the last slide, David? I'm sure I put it in. Oh, no. This is, this is, my, this is my swan song to end it all. And I, in my confusion, I have forgotten to put Jenny's Bible. Hold, stand up, Jenny, and hold your Bible up. You've got it open. Hold Jenny's. She's going to hold the Bible up. I'm going to read it out. But out of Jenny's student Bible, um, there was a description that said, our life before and after Christ. And so, um, uh, Jenny, you can come and read it. Sorry, you have a different voice. Have a different voice. So... I had it on a, I had it, she sent it to me and I thought it's so, such a good summary. 
So our life before and after Christ. <laughs> right. <laughs> our life before Christ. We were under God's curse. After Christ, we're loved by God. Our life before Christ, we were doomed because of our sins. After Christ, we were shown God's mercy and given salvation. Before Christ, we went along with the crowd. After Christ, we stand for Christ and truth. Before Christ, we were God's enemies. After Christ, we're God's children. Before Christ, we were enslaved to Satan. After Christ, we were free to love and serve Christ. Before Christ, we followed our evil thoughts and passions. After Christ, we are seated with Christ in glory. Before Christ, we were under God's anger or wrath. Wrath. After Christ, we were given undeserved favor or grace. And before Christ, we were spiritually dead. After Christ, we are given a new spiritual life in Christ. Amen. 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 Amen.